of a piece of driftwood at, at water's edge. So I've always been a, a still photographer. Mark, I did take a 20 or 30 year detour into the <laughs> corporate world. Yeah. Uh, I, I am a little bit unusual that way. Uh, I was on Wall Street for a decade. I was in pharmaceutical market research for a decade, a bunch of startups. And it took me until I was in my 50s to figure out what I actually love to do. And I didn't see a reason to do that only in my spare time because I didn't have any. Right. So a couple of years ago, I opened up a shingle. Three Blind Men and an Elephant is a very small production house with a very large animal logo. And uh, I just, I love filmmaking. I love writing. Uh, I had my first screenplay optioned at the end of last year. And uh, I love the gear. I love the gear, even though I know it shouldn't be about the gear. I love the gear. But that just means that we're gearheads as well as photographers, so. Yeah, I can feel the lump. (laughs) Right. Um, the, the funny thing is, is that I actually quit corporate America probably about five, almost six years ago, maybe a little bit longer than that. And I, I remember just sitting there in my cubicle thinking, I am not going to waste one more day pissing my life away underneath these fluorescent tubes, not being able to go outside when I want, not being able to go create something when I want. And I'm not to mention, uh, the phone business as far as tech support has got to be one of the most soul-sucking jobs I've ever had in my entire life. I, I hear office space being channeled into this conversation. Yes. But I, I get you. In, in fact, at one point in the, uh, in the late 80s, I was working for a major money center bank in midtown Manhattan, and uh, I would uh, actually get disoriented because of the fluorescent lighting. Oh, I'd yeah. actually have to step outside. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's like a very a disorienting color hue. It really is. And I've gotten progressively more sensitive to that because, among other things, I'm uh, evaluating LEDs all the time, and I'm finally beginning to recognize tints that shouldn't be there. So <laughs> right. pretty interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I constantly notice hues. I'm like, oh, man, you definitely had fluorescent tubes in the room, did you not? Yeah. And it's pretty bad, but um, I, um, I also, speaking of making these big life choices and swapping over to something that was more meaningful. Um, I happened to pick up on a story <clears throat> about a movie and I believe it was like real, it was real indie film, but it was actually called homeless and it's actually about a high class, very well known brushing with all the, uh, the star shoulders and stuff in, in New York and stuff like that. Um, the story is called is homeless. This- is this the male model? No, yes, it is, as a matter of fact. And uh, right. it, it won the Grand Jury Award uh, at New York's uh, Documentary Film Festival. And not just that, it won a, sh- a ton of awards. Um, from the International Hoffer Filmage, uh, the winner of uh, the official selection of uh, Doc- uh, Docaviv, it, it, it won just a slew of awards. And it's essentially... Um, I've actually got the link down in the description below. It's actually about a male model turned photographer that had a lot of money going into this, traveled the world a bit to go complete his photography education, and then shows back up in New York to absolutely nothing. He had nothing. And uh, he ends up spending, I believe it was like six years, uh, living as a homeless person on the roof of a building, all the while wearing wonderfully tailored Italian suits, <laughs> Italian leather shoes, just a gorgeous uh, story of perseverance without ever asking for uh, a handout or any help. It was very inspiring to me. Well, it's, it really reinforces the notion that it, at the end of the day, it is about the story. And that's a lot harder to do, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would. Um, I would almost. I would almost wonder how a person could get away with it that long. It's like you know, did you never have a house guest, or or did ever anyone ever get suspicious of this guy? Never inviting him over for for drinks, or you know, what exactly was that process where he could get away with it so long, and no one ever, no one ever picked up on it. 
You know, I think I might have to watch this movie to find out. I did read a couple of weeks ago about a high-tech entrepreneur who decided to change, downsize, got rid of his uh, big house, and just decided to couch surf with friends. And he started off with his best friend, his dearest friend. And that lasted uh, just a couple of days before he said, that's it, get out of here. <laughs> so this guy is clearly skilled. Although I do remember reading that part of the time he spent not just on the roofs, but on fire escapes. Yes, I think I remember reading that too. And the only reason he was able to get up on top of these roofs um, was the fact that he had a key to the building of a friend's house um, and was able to just get access to his friend's building's roof. So it, it wasn't even like it was maybe an apartment building that he had used to stay at. It was a friend's apartment building. So he just made the best of a really horrible situation and somehow managed to keep it from everyone the whole time. It's, it's, wow. it's a fascinating story. All right, I'm sold. Yeah, I, I, it. it's not supposed to come out till August the 7th, but I am biting, I am chomping at the bit to see this thing. Well, I also want to see Tangerine. Uh, I can't say I, I can't say that it would be the first thing on my list based on the storyline uh, mm -hmm. from what little of it. But the fact that the whole thing was done on an iPhone 5 really intrigues me. Uh, the fact that it was done with an anamorphic adapter is really intriguing to me. Uh, and in fact, this led me to interview the uh, co-founders of Moondog Labs, the people who make that anamorphic adapter. And it's a very interesting story because these are ex-Kodak employees. Right. You know, and, and for decades, for a century, Kodak was it. And then in 2010 or 2011, it went bankrupt and went from, you know, 50,000 world-class employees to just about nothing. And it's only coming out of bankruptcy in the last couple of years, but there's still an incredible pool of talent. And it's fascinating because uh, uh, Julie Gerstenberger and Scott uh, Cahall uh, recognize that cinematographers are not looking for perfection. Well, some of us aren't. They're looking for personality. And, and as a lens designer, Scott and, and Julie, having worked at Kodak for 26 years, are interested in getting to perfection. And instead, they're being asked to design in personality, which they understand as flaws. Right. So I, I really want to see this. I, I think this is fascinating. And the, the iPhone is just the next stage of what's already happened to Canon at the hands of Panasonic and Sony with the mirrorless. Right. Yeah, it really is. It's, it's, it's very much a, uh, a uh, David and Goliath story all over again. Yeah, well, in, in the case of Sony and Canon, it's really two Goliaths. Um, they're both, you know, multi, multi-billion dollar companies. But you're right, uh, Mark, because Canon absolutely, of course, is dominant in DSLRs. And Sony had, there's your ferret. Yes. yes. Cool. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, so Sony uh, was not dominant. Sony was losing money hand over fist and pretty sad. And, of course, they had that whole debacle with their servers being hacked. But now, Sony has turned around. They've uh, recorded their largest profit since, I think, 2007. And meanwhile, Canon just took a 16% hit to its profits on weakness in not only point-and-shoot, but DSLRs. I mean, the handwriting is on the wall for that. And when you look at what's, what's happening in the iPhone market, it's even a leading indicator of mirrorless. Mm -hmm. So, Yeah, it really stuff. is. Um and I saw the, the the promo material for Tangerine, I think, before I ever realized um, that it was shot on the iPhone 5. And then it really got me sort of questioned because I, I realized that they may have gotten most of the footage via the iPhone 5. But I began to wonder what other implements, what other uh, accoutrement that they had around them while they were trying to get that video. I mean, because... I realize as much as the, the next indie filmmaker that you cannot do everything with the iPhone. And, and that's granted. So I, a lot of the hype was around the fact that the video part might have been. But I wonder how many support structures they had around it in order to make that a feasible venture. 
I think that's an absolutely great question, and there is somewhere on the web, as we speak, a 35-minute interview with the maker of Tangerine, and uh, I think he talks about some of that. Uh, I had just started it before I had to shift to something else, but I was on it long enough to hear him say that the first thing you need is some kind of stabilizer. You're right. Uh, yeah. and, and the fact of the matter is uh, the iPhone is so light that you can have the jibs or the cranes or the stabilizers, but they're so much smaller, they're so much less expensive, they're so much faster to balance Really, when you spend less money on the camera body, you have money for the other things that really make a dynamic camera movement. Yeah, um, and not only do you would I would I understand you know as far as having stabilizers for the camera, but just to th just to think about maybe what their lighting rigs were looking like or what their video or their audio capture rigs were looking like, you know. Uh, what kind of, you know, were they using a full-blown DAT or were they running around with just an H, uh, like a Zoom H4n or something like that? You know, how minimal did they try to keep their gear in order to sell the fact that, you know, because if you only used a $500 iPhone but then turned around and used, you know, $50,000. cannibalize their profits and, and they just refuse to deal with it. Well, so somebody else or a bunch of somebody else's did it for them. And uh, yep. with DSLRs, yep. you're, you're exactly right. It's the same thing with computers. IBM said, oh, PCs will never do anything. Boom. Digital Equipment Corporation, mini computers, same thing. I remember Ken Olson, the founder of DEC, which was the success story, Route 128 up in Boston saying, PCs are toys, DEC is no more. Uh, right. So right. It's, it's absolutely fascinating. But the other thing is, when someone who really uses a DSLR and knows how to use it, a real professional or a gifted amateur, mm -hmm. either one, mm -hmm. because the gifted amateur has the passion. Yes. Uh, and, yes. They, and, and they say that, that mirrorless can't do everything and, and they don't like it as much. It's legitimate. The fact of the matter is, every time there's a new technology, Every time there's a dif disruptive technology, it starts off less capable than yeah. the dominant yeah. technology of the day. That is always the case. The and there's also an, uh, an acclimation period, too. So, you know, there's a lot of times where you're, it's just something completely different and you just, you, you're very uh, set in your ways, too. That's right. The, the thing that's interesting is that people don't understand what the technology curve looks like. So anytime you've got a new technology, for a while it's just moving along the bottom. And all of a sudden, it hits this sweet spot and takes off. And eventually, it hits a plateau and goes like this until the next S-curve comes behind it. Yeah. Okay? Yep. So, you know, the speed graphic, the 4x5 speed graphic, that was the bomb. That was the press camera. And right. as early as the 1930s with, with Leica or the 20s with Leica, there was this little 35-millimeter camera. Oh, it's a crappy little negative. It'll never amount to anything. Boom. 4x5 went away. 35-millimeter took over. 35-millimeter yep. film. Boom, taken over by digital. DSLRs, boom, they're being taken over by mirrorless. And now I'm telling you, and, and I've just written about it extensively, it is astounding what smartphones will be able to do in the next two years. Astounding. I agree. Um, and it's, it's not like that, uh, you know, cell phones can't compete now. I mean, under the right lighting conditions, I mean, you may not get the same depth of field because of the, the sensor size and everything, but as far as grabbing a sharp image or as far as not being able to expose correctly, they are packing a lot of tech into such small devices these days. And it only gets better. I mean, every single uh, revolution, every, every new generation always brings a lot of new innovations, new chip technologies, quicker, faster ways to process all this data. And... 
I don't think in a million years anyone that was shooting on a huge Ari Alexa ever thought in a million years that they were going to be able to start shooting on cameras no bigger than a Rubik's Cube like the Red Epics and, and all those kind of things. It's, it is amazing what we're able to pack down into such small devices, and it really it does democratize creativity. Now, the big wigs over in Hollywood don't have a... Um, uh, they don't have full control over stuff that can be awesome anymore. Um, you, then you have amazing products like, even if you're shooting on digital, you have products like Film Convert and freely available lookup tables where you can transform those digital colors over and transform them into film colors. You've got so many different tools at your disposal now that the only thing that's keeping you from doing the project that you've always wanted to do is you. That's it. I, I agree. There is a uh, film festival in the UK called the Colchester Film Festival. I mm-hmm. just became aware mm-hmm. of this, Mark. And one of the things that's so interesting about this, they have a 60-hour challenge. And so your subscribers, your viewers may be interested in this because to the point of creativity as opposed to gear per se, what the Colchester Film Festival does, and this is uh, in October, sign up is free. Uh, It's an incredible panel of judges, and there are some nice uh, prizes, but that's really not why you do it. They, for each team that registers, they give you a title, one line of dialogue, something that has to show up somewhere in the film, like sticking the finger up in the air to check the wind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's it. Then you've got 60 hours to shoot, edit, and post your maximum five minutes short. And I think that's just a fantastic prompt to create uh, an ambition, and I encourage people to check it out. Uh, Here in in Philadelphia, we we have had the Philadelphia Hackathon, uh, the Philly Do-Gooder Hackathon. And uh, we, we entered that uh, in 2014, an amazing experience, where filmmakers are thrown in a room with social impact organizations. And literally, you pull names out of a jar and you match organization with filmmaker, and then you've got two weeks to shoot a public service announcement. Again, hmm. fantastic. Hmm. It, it can't be about the gear so much as it is about what is it that you're going to say and how you're going to say it. So... Yeah, I agree. Um, And I want to actually get to your article about um, that you just wrote today on Planet 5D uh, about the reports that were actually predicted about video pro use of the DSLRs going down to such an extent that it might not even be, uh, it it might not even be barely register. Uh, you, You want to be able to register the amount of pro video users that are using DSLRs in sales by the year 2019 is that what that says well i don't have it in front of me but it looks like you do so the thing that's so interesting about this is not that this consulting firm says there's a 41 percent drop uh it's that it's one more data point and then you have the rock hard irrefutable stat that Canon's second quarter profits are down 16%. So that's why I put those two together. And we... Vincent LaForge uh, had uh, a post he did several months ago where he said, the iPhones, uh, so the smartphones, he actually said, so the smartphones have won. And he believed, and I agree with him completely, that there will continue to be a role for DSLRs, but really only for professionals, really only yeah. top of the food yeah. chain. If you really need, well, first of all, if you've already got the gear, you're not going to throw it out for something else. Right. But, but you know, they need the weather sealing. They need to be able to drop it from helicopters. I mean, they, they need that. On the other hand, when you think about casual photographers, uh, right. the people right. who get the, the low level, you know, the, uh, the DX version of the Nikons, get the Canon Rebels. Most of them are not using a fraction of those cameras' capabilities. It's like software bloat. You know, Microsoft Word, 95% of it we don't use. Uh, Right, exactly. and, And so when you've got people 
who really just want to have an easy photograph of their family where they don't have to think and they want to be able to post it, a smartphone is actually a superior proposition. And so the whole middle is being hollowed out. It's being hollowed out first at the point and shoot level by smartphones. It's being hollowed mm -hmm. out at the kind of prosumer level by mirrorless. I mean, really, if you're doing a high, if you have a, need a hybrid camera where it's stills and video, mm -hmm. mirrorless is a superior technology. It's a superior form factor. It's a superior price point. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I, I rewatched your video earlier today, the one that you released seven months ago, talking about um, the uh, Top Gear of 2014, where you're discussing all the, the pros of the A6000. It's even, w with the firmware updates, it's even progressed beyond what you thought it was seven months ago. And me too. Uh, with the, the firmware update two, now we have access to a very good, I wouldn't say professional grade, Kodak. I would much rather have 100 megabits per second, but in the for the sake of size and space of the files, 50 megabits per second on video files is a very respectable amount of data that you could actually use in your editors and pull some amazing detail out of your shadows and your highlights and still be able to be way under budget if some of these guys would just take the chance on this tech mirrorless it's um it did kind of seem as a bit of a novelty at first i'll agree because you know i had full frame nikon i had absolutely no desire to carry around some dinky little thing that made me look like uh uncle joe at the wedding or whatever it's like no dude i'm the <laughs> photographer you know i'm not, i'm not here with the family you know so i i can see where it is but it's, it's total size queening it really is it's it's that whole thing where well, bigger is always better, I guess, you know. Well, so, so I'll, I'll just say this. You see how little, how thin and gray this is? <laughs> I, I, I've reached that age where I really don't care anymore. I've, it's taken me a very long time, but I finally figured out that the size of my equipment is not indicative of the size of my equipment. And uh, <laughs> Good point. That's and, a very good point. And, and, Again, the lighting is not great here, but this A6000, I have now shot professional corporate films with just stellar, stellar. Doing the firmware 2.0 because I don't know why I really did it. Because I sat there and I thought to myself, you know, I've heard about this XAVSC uh, or XAVCS Kodak. Yeah. And I get it theoretically. I do. But you and I talked about this earlier, and here's the thing. There is nothing that I'm doing right now that's being shown. Actually, I'll take that back. We entered uh, a contest several months ago where we shot a short exclusively on an iPhone, and it was a mm -hmm. finalist. Mm -hmm. And so they, sh they projected the finalists up onto in a, an auditorium on this, right. you know, and it held up. The footage held up. Yeah. But here's my point. Short of that, you, me, most of the people who are watching this now, where is our stuff being posted? It's not it's in online. theaters. No, it's, it's online. online. And, and you've got compression from the providers. So, you know, this notion of 10-bit 422, mm -hmm. I get it if you're a, a colorist. I know that it allows you to do things that you can't do. Although, by the way, as a still photographer, unless it's raw, it, it's yeah. just appalling to me how little you can do. Mm -hmm. You know, you move the slider just a little bit and the image, in my estimation, turns to crap. So, Absolutely. one, it means try to capture the image in camera. Capture yeah. it in camera. And to your earlier point, light, so that the dynamic range doesn't have to be tremendous. Right. But then you sit there and go, you know what? I don't need more than 8-bit 420. Just, you just don't. It's, it's yeah. astounding. And, um, you, know, you know, I sat around and I thought about it quite, quite a bit myself that a lot of the, uh, the large format photographers and stuff like that, they were using, you know, 8 megapixel digital backs you know, 10 years ago, and their stuff was still showing up on billboards. 
Um, but they also realized that that stuff was going to be so far away, you weren't going to be able to sit right on top of the screen and pixel peep the shit out of that image. So knowing your gear is half as important as owning good gear. Um, and, you know, that was another reason that I bought uh, the, uh, the iMac 5K display. Because I thought, you know, if I can make... Oh. Oh. Yeah, I know. I'm sitting in front of this thing right now. Um, but I, I knew that if the if the footage that I was going to be able to get, if I can make it look good on this display, which should reveal every single flaw, then I know that I can make it look good on any other display out there because even the best TVs right now are only in 4K. You know, you've got a lot of people out there shooting 6. Some people are even talking about shooting 8K. Um and while I realize it makes it much easier to be a sloppy videographer or photographer to go that big with your footage, but it's not necessary. If you already have the skill and you know how to light, you know how to compose, you know how to do the things you need to do. If you have good practices, even a little bit, even a fundamental grasp on best practices, you can make Stuff that comes off this beautiful, cheap. I got my A6000 for 348 bucks. Got it at Best Buy on an open box. And no one believed me. No one believed me when I stood up there and said, I'm ditching Nikon, I'm selling all of it. And now, it's just like dominoes. One quote-unquote pro photographer after another is just falling down going, hey, I tried it out and it was pretty flipping awesome. And they're, they're picking up Sony lenses. Oh, my God, these lenses are so light. Oh, my God, this, that, and the other. And it just, the testimonials keep rolling in. And I think, to a large extent, that's the reason I tried to stay humble when I first started out with this because I didn't want to be, ah, Sony's better or Nikon's better. I never wanted to be the, the fanboy cheerleader because as soon as you start to embed yourself, really kind of dig in, that's when something new is going to come along and make you look like a big asshole. So I didn't want to be that guy. <laughs> well, personally, I, I have no problem and, and in fact, enjoy uh, calling trends early. Uh, sure. I, I enjoy having an opinion. And if someone doesn't like my opinion, it, that's fine, you know, to, to each his own. There's, there's no problem about that. And uh, look... The, the Leica rangefinder is a phenomenal piece of gear. It's, it's industrial design artistry in the hand. Uh, as I said, my, my first exposure to a camera was a Leica. I can't get good pictures out of it. Uh, I just can't. And I, I bought one. I had an M8 with the 35 millimeter uh, Summicron and mm -hmm. the 90 millimeter uh, Elmerit. And uh, the glass was incredible. Just yeah. incredible, but yeah. because it was a rangefinder, uh, mm -hmm. and because the sensor mm -hmm. was not really that good, I just could not get great things out of it. And back to the the video uh, review that I did seven months ago, I mean the A six thousand is what the M eight really should have been. So I I think that's that's just phenomenal. And you know, and for, for people, for people. Uh, I, I do know a lot of people out there that go out and they'll buy very expensive camera gear, whether it be you know 5D Mark Threes. That was actually considered pretty expensive when it came out. Um, the D810 uh, from Nikon, um, the A7S. Now the A7R Mark II is out. Uh, you've got really high range, uh, high powered cameras. As, as far as video world goes, you've got your Reds. But when you actually put the as far as video is concerned, I know that a lot of people that watch my channel are really interested in, uh, they're photographers, but in order to be a good video maker, it pays to know a lot about photography as well. Absolutely. And, um, you're not, when you put the footage side by side, it doesn't look that, that much different. What, what ends up being different is your flexibility as a creative to manipulate it. So it would, I would equate it to someone having a starter set of paints from Hobby Lobby as opposed to going to a real art store and picking up just a massive treasure trove of all different types of paints with different acrylics and different latexes and all different hues and everything. You get this massive pile of awesome in front of you that I think for a lot of people is just about being in a candy store. 
You know, what is going to give me the most flexibility as a creative so that I can realize my vision? And as soon as a piece of gear stops helping you, it begins hurting you. And then, and then, and only then, I think you should upgrade or change to something different. Don't keep up with the Joneses. Don't just buy something because I think it's awesome. Or don't just buy something because some internet personality is going, this is the best and it's the most expensive. And when you click on my Amazon link, that's where I'm going to get the most commission. I'm not trying to do that. I only want my viewers to upgrade when it truly begins to limit them creatively. And I won't just go out and buy something just because. I don't, I don't, I'm not worried about what I look like to everyone else. If it hinders me, I'll upgrade it. But other than that, I'm not going to. I like what I've got. The E6000, I have yet to buy a full frame camera from Sony as of yet. Only because there's not much that I haven't been able to do with that stupid little A6000. It's ridiculous how much fun <laughs> I've been able to have with that thing. Absolutely right. I agree with you. I, uh, I traded down from the 5D Mark II, got a pair of Rebel SL1s. <laughs> And yeah. uh, the Rebel SL1 yeah. is an incredible, or at the time I thought it was an incredible little uh, hybrid. It was certainly better than the 5D Mark II uh, yeah. for what yeah. I did. But you know, look, we like what we like, and if someone else doesn't, it's, it's all good. Because at the end of the day, in the totality of human experience, mm -hmm. one camera mm -hmm. versus another, it, it doesn't matter. The thing that's, that's interesting is that you're right, you talk about the democratization of the technology. When, you, when ordinary citizens are capturing things on their smartphones, which lead to murder charges, yeah. that's powerful yeah. and that's actually important. The rest mm -hmm. of it, it's, it's just what we enjoy. Background and noise. Background yeah, and, and there's nothing wrong with saying, look, I like the way this feels in my hand, or I like the way that feels in my hand. But to your point, Mark, you're right. The differences uh, among the gear are actually much smaller than, than we, we might uh, prefer to think. We led to believe, that, yeah. But the, the flip side is, you know, for some of us who, uh, who are obsessive compulsive or anal retentive, you know. <laughs> That'd be me. Yeah, you know, it's, it's fine. It's, it's fine. You know, just do no harm, really. Yeah, that, sure. That's, uh, and if you're a gearhead, just admit it. You know, it's okay to want a lot of shit. If you just want <laughs> 15 or 20 cameras at your, disposable, uh, at your disposal at any given time, just say that. That's okay. You don't have to be choosy. You can be very polygamous with your gear. It's not going to bother me, but, you know, no one, in my, 